Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lyles College of Engineering Tech Talks, celebrating National Engineers Week. My name is Rebecca Wass, and I serve as the Communications Specialist for the Lyles College of Engineering at Fresno State. Today's presenter is Mr. Ron Birch, Fresno State alumnus and Director of Advanced Military Satellite Communications at the Boeing Space and Launch Group, located in El Segundo, California. Mr. Birch received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Fresno State in 1982 and a Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering with an emphasis in Communication Science from the California Institute of Technology, also known as Caltech, in 1984. Mr. Birch has spent more than a decade developing next generation resilient military satellite communication systems architectures and solutions for the US government and international allies. He joined Hughes Space and Communications as a member of the technical staff in 1982 as an RF design engineer. And that was prior to Hughes later acquisition by the Boeing company. Mr. Birch has performed many roles throughout his career, including design engineering, subsystem engineering, project engineering, and project management. Assignments have included military satellite communication systems development and managing the development of laser communication systems for space. For, 11, for the past 11 years, Mr. Birch has worked on developing, evaluating new and evaluating new military satellite communication solutions to provide resilience to emerging threats. In 2019, his book, Resilient Space Systems Design, an introduction was published. He also is named on two US patent, patents. Before we get started today, I'd like to encourage everyone to please place your questions in the, in the Q&A. And uh, now I'd like to open the floor to Mr. Ron Birch as he discusses making future space systems resilient. Great, thank you very much, Rebecca. I, <laughs> I really appreciate the introduction and it is great to uh, be back with, with Fresno State, uh, even if it is uh, virtually. Um, this is a topic that uh, I've been working on for about the last 10 or 15 years. It's, uh, it's something that probably 15 or 20 years ago would have been considered pretty obscure. Um, the things that we did, we, we did as a consequence of designing uh, robust and reliable satellites. But over the last probably 10 or 15 years, there's been a realization that uh, just designing for reliability isn't really uh, sufficient in order to uh, ensure that you're going to have an operational system over the, the mission life. And so the realization has been that uh, there's this concept called resilience and people started talking about resilient space systems and exactly what that means. So what I'm going to talk about today is from a designer's point of view, um, you know, how do you go about tackling this problem? Because it's something that, again, we, we tackled parts of the problem uh, from the very beginning, but the further we get into it and, and the changing environment that we find ourselves in, it's, uh, it's become a bigger challenge than it used to be. So with that, um, let me just share some, some charts here. <clears throat> So uh, as Rebecca said, I am an alumnus, uh, BSWE in 82, had a great time, uh, you know, lived in the area, grew up in the area. And so uh, I get back from time to time. It's always, it's always fun. I'm hoping that uh, I'll be up there again before too long. <clears throat> I think that uh, Rebecca already pretty much took care of this uh, as far as who I am and why I'm talking about this. I do have over 35 years in the space industry, focusing mainly on communications, but um, I've also more increasingly looked at system architectures and future architectures. And um, we, we don't only cater to the military, we uh, have customers that are commercial, we have civil, and we have uh, government as well. So uh, this concept of resilient space doesn't just apply to government systems, it applies to the entire industry. And it's interesting to see how different companies are, uh, or different organizations are approaching uh, the problem differently. 
<clears throat> so first and foremost, just to take a step back, uh, looking at modern space systems today, uh, if I say space, most people think about the satellites, which is you know, admittedly where we focus a lot of our energy. But a space system is so much more than that. Um, we have a system that's broken up into different segments. And so there's a space segment, which does have the satellites, but there's a lot that's on the ground that enables you to operate the system and to basically disseminate information to whoever is using it. Um, you know, this graphic here shows a, a military satellite communication system. Uh, the ground segment includes all the satellite operations. If uh, you need to have locations that can talk to the satellite to bring data to the ground, you need that. Sometimes you might need data processing. Um, that's, that's all a big part of making it work. And a control segment to command the satellites and to pull down their telemetry to understand their health. And then of course a network which uh, connects all of these things together because some of them are in different geographic locations. And if it's a communication system, you have these um, geographically dispersed users out there uh, who need to talk to the satellites as well. So they need their own radios or terminals. The, the point I guess is that you have this uh, very rich and complex system that has to work together and all parts of the system have to work in order for it to deliver its, its products. And modern space systems, I keep saying, are, are really information systems, if you think about it, because what they're doing these days is they're, uh, they're either rerouting or, or relaying communications between different people, or if it's a sensing system, they're delivering uh, imagery. Uh, but all of it is, is really generating and, and moving data around. So sometimes it helps to think of it more as an information system than a quote unquote, a space system. So generally space systems are uh, designed to carry out one or more missions. And uh, there are a vast number of examples that are up there today, uh, each of which delivers a different capability. And these products or services are then delivered to certain users or operators. Um, the, the, the systems you see here are things like communications. Uh, people are very familiar with GPS. That service is provided by over 30 satellites for navigation. Uh, <clears throat> there are missile warning satellites that keep an eye on what gets launched. There are even satellites like the space-based surveillance system that are watching what's happening out in space to keep an eye on, on other satellites and debris and things like that. And then of course, weather and imaging, there are all kinds of satellites out there, but a resilient space system is one that continues to operate even in what we call a contested environment. And a contested environment means that uh, there are threats to the system out there. They could be in space, they could be on the ground, but if they are successful uh, and, and some impact to the system occurs, you could lose that, that uh, service to the users. And that's what you're trying to avoid because many of these systems, the investment you're talking about could be in the billions of dollars. And you certainly don't want to put in place a multi-billion dollar system and then discover that, um, because of one or more of these threats, it could be offline for a significant amount of time or perhaps forever. Uh, and then you've lost your entire investment. And in particular today, we have uh, companies out there like DirecTV or XM Radio, whose entire business depends upon having operational satellites. If they lose those satellites, they literally have no business. So it's not just the the military that's con concerned about someone targeting their satellites, it's also, are there other hazards out there that could take down a, an entire commercial enterprise? The, uh, when I joined uh, what was then Hughes Space and Communications after getting out of school in the early 80s, I would say it was a really exciting time. There was a lot of activity in, in space and uh, a lot of key technologies were finally maturing so you could do things that you couldn't do before, uh, particularly in the space, but also on the ground. 
And, um, and then the industry kind of matured and um, things kept getting bigger and more complicated and more capable, um, exquisite systems started emerging. But since then, things have kind of uh, gone what I would call linear <laughs> in terms of growth and so forth up until a few years ago. And now it's perhaps even more dynamic than it was back then. We're talking about all kinds of people jumping in. Uh, governments are changing the way they look at space. Commercial industry has a huge amount of investment going on. Currently, there are over 300 commercial and government satellites that are in what we call a geosynchronous orbit, which is stationary over the earth. These are the kinds of satellites that relay um, you know, telephone calls and TV, uh, they broadcast uh, direct TV, things like that. Uh, but then there are also the sensing and imaging satellites, which are typically in lower orbits, and uh, they're closer, and some of those are weather satellites. All of these things are growing, and many of them are growing because commercial industry is picking up what used to be only the domain of government. Um, and you also have something in what we call a medium Earth orbit. Typically, these are those navigation systems. Those have also been proliferating. Uh, it used to just be GPS, and now there are half a dozen different uh, government systems that are up there. So space is, is literally exploding. Um, and, and in particular, what we're seeing is uh, you're seeing a lot of smaller satellites that are more proliferated, like Starlink, OneWeb, um, and a lot of big operators like Intelsat and Inmarsat are now looking at maybe they don't need these very few large expensive satellites, but maybe they can break up their capability into smaller ones. So um, it's, a, it's a very dynamic industry and it changes the calculus when you start talking about how you design these systems. That kind of brings us to the question of, well, we're talking about resilient space what is resilience? <laughs> and um, if any of you have any contact with the space industry or uh, you like to keep track of it, and you, you maybe watch NASA, NASA TV, uh, over the last few years, this, uh, this term resilience has just popped up. And in fact, it, it's kind of funny, but once you start look, listening for it, you start hearing it everywhere. People talk about, you know, survivable, uh, resilient microbes and uh, people will talk about, you know, an NBA team being resilient. Uh, it's kind of funny, but when we talk about it in terms of space, there are all these other words that start popping up, um, you know, flexibility, extensibility, diversification, distribution, disaggregation. And, and what you kind of need to do is to grapple with all of this is to kind of sort it out make it a little less complicated. And that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying in the space industry is to develop a common language, a common methodology, how we can deal with this so that we can better design systems in the future that are more resilient to a number of different threats. Um, you know, I always joke about when you just talk to someone who isn't, um, in engineering or in space, and you just ask them, you know, resilience, what do you think of resilience? What does that mean to you? You know, and it's kind of like this, you know, it's like if you ever took your first starting physics class, you've got a ball and you drop it, and you know, how, how uh, high it bounces back is kind of like, oh, well, if it's, uh, if it's really uh, resilient, then it kind of bounces higher. Um, and when you look at the term resilience and you just look at the definitions that are out there. Um, Miriam Webster, you know, they have one, one definition, tending to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. And that's actually not a bad definition even applied to space. Subsequently, um, the US government in particular has become very uh, almost obsessed with this concept of resilience and how to get to it. And so they spent a lot of time trying to come up with definitions. They had one in 2013 uh, in a white paper. They talk about the ability of a system architecture to continue providing required capabilities in the face of system failures, environmental challenges, 
or adversary actions. So that's a little bit more specific. And even the Aerospace Corporation, which uh, supports the, the Pentagon and others, says, uh, you know, resilience, this in 2017, is not consistently defined across the space community. Um, and they have their own definition. So when I'm talking to you today, I, I just like to put it up front that there have been many different definitions out there. There is probably no single accepted definition, but most have some very common elements. One is that you have these adverse conditions and hostile actions, which are described as threats and you need to deal with them. Um, the, uh, the act of continuing to survive despite being in one of these contested environments, that you have to maintain some minimum level of whatever capability you have, despite any of the impacts that you might suffer, um, that you can recover or reconstitute lost capability, and also just the idea that you can adjust to changing conditions. And those are common themes. And, and as we go forward, you know, you'll see that no matter who you talk to, those, those will keep coming out time and again. Uh, you have to be able to be uh, as, as much as possible, be robust, but also be able to recover and perhaps avoid the threat altogether. So uh, moving on to what, what a space system that's resilient looks like, uh, kind of a simple way to boil it down is to say that resilient systems are those that maintain some minimum mission capability that is required to provide your, your user what they need, despite the fact that there may be one or more threats out there that are conspiring against you. And frankly, most of the systems built up until the last couple of years anyway, were not really designed to operate in what we call this growing congested and contested environment. And I'm gonna get into it a little bit more, but the fact is that we had identified two or three specific threats and uh, we didn't really take some of the others too seriously because they weren't very credible, but that has changed. And not only that, but there's a lot more up there in space. So you have things like orbital debris that you have to worry about. And just the fact that uh, the more that's up there, the more things can uh, you know, collide or interfere with each other. Um, if you wanna get down to a metric of some kind, Really, what we're talking about is the little graphic that's down here in the corner, where um, in a steady state, normal daily operation, you have a certain capability. It could be a certain amount of bandwidth or certain number of images you take every, every day. And then you encounter a threat and perhaps uh, an event happens that impacts your system. And after everything happens, after you recover, if you can reconstitute, you're left with some amount of capability. And if you lose some capability, then the resilience is really the projected or expected fraction of what you started with. So you could say that if you lost 60% of that capability, your resilience was really 0.4 or 40%. And that's really all we're talking about. You're trying to preserve as much of your original capability as possible, despite the fact that you know, somebody might be trying to do something to you. So that in a nutshell is what we're talking about. At this point, some people would be saying, well, wait a minute, but I always heard that the satellites particularly are really reliable and, uh, you know, doesn't that kind of take care of it? And the answer actually is, well, if you do it right, it could take care of part of it, but reliability and resilience are really two different measures. Uh, reliability is measured as kind of a probability of success over some period of time. So, you know, if you, uh, if you buy your washing machine and it's got a 10 year warranty, you can bet that whoever designed it for the company that's selling it has, uh, has designed it so that it will, you know, in all likelihood, 95, 99% of the time, it's gonna last at least 10 years. Um, we all know that in reality, that's actually one day after the warranty, but still in all, it's going to be last 10 years, let's say. Um, and they measure that in things like mean time between failures, but it's a failure rate based calculation. But the important thing is that reliability accounts for these system outages, the fact that you lose the use of it due to some internal failure. 
something in the system failed. And when you do these projections, it's largely based on historical failure rate data for those components. You, you've measured things like motors and flywheels and whatever, and you know that you know, when you put it all together, the whole, whole uh, washing machine is going to last for that amount of time. Resilience is different. It's looking at this expected value of a residual capability when a threat comes in from the side and hits your system. So in this case, you could still have an outage. You, you still don't get the service, but it's due to an external threat, not an internal failure. There are two different mechanisms, even though they can have the same result. But the fact is that to, to estimate resilience, you need to know something about the threat. In terms of reliability, if you've designed this from things that you've done before, you largely know what, what information you need to do the reliability calculation. So resilience is a little bit harder because you tend to have less of the information that you need as a designer. The other thing about it is that um, there are some threat mitigations that you can build into a system that will do both. It will give you higher resilience and higher reliability. And an example of that would be a lot of times in satellites, we uh, have redundant hardware. We put in uh, primary and redundant and if something happens to the primary, if it fails, we switch to the redundant unit. Well, in a resilience sense, that could happen to be the same kind of mitigation. Only in this case, something bad happened because somebody fried your unit, you still would have the opportunity to recover by flipping over to the other unit. So there is some connection between the two and I like to compare them because there are things we learn from reliability, which is a documented discipline these days, 40 or 50 years worth of it. In the future, we'd like resilience to be similar. Everybody understands what it means and how to calculate it. Now, talking about, um, you know, from a design point of view, which is really what I've been coming at it from, uh, what we have is we normally, as designers, we do trade studies in order to optimize the design of a system. And this is, again, the same, even if you weren't designing a space system, if you were designing a Ferrari. Uh, you may have different designs and you wanna look at the pros and cons of each one of them. And typically in the past, particularly with the satellites, uh, we had a, more of a two-dimensional trade space here. Um, it tended to be between cost and performance. We were kind of running along this line here. And the more that you spend, generally the better performance you get and vice versa. But now you have this issue that, let's say I spend a lot of money, I get a great system, but I launch the system, I get it up and running, and within a year, somebody has figured out how to disable it. Well, that wasn't a very good investment. Nobody's gonna give me billions of dollars the next time to put up a system that somebody can, can take out very easily. And um, you know, this is the same kind of thing as cybersecurity um, you know, with your laptop. Uh, you could buy the world's best laptop, but if a hacker can get in and lock you out of it, um, it doesn't really do you very, very much good. So what's happened is that the trade space has opened up now. It's becoming this three, three-way trade. And the third, third leg over here is now resilience. And now you're balancing the three of them. You're balancing cost, performance, and resilience, because you have to know that if you don't make the system resilient enough, then you may have sacrificed these two for nothing. On the other hand, resilience typically isn't free. Um, I like to refer to it as a resilience tax. And the fact is too, that when you put in certain uh, mitigations against some of these risks, uh, the, the threats, you could actually end up compromising some of your performance as well. So you don't get the top of the top of the top in terms of performance, but you get to keep what you have. <laughs> and so that's very important. So it's a balancing act between all three of these. And it's made the, uh, the design uh, activity more complicated because we now have more requirements. Over here, we now have requirements for resilience as well as performance. And of course, we always have a budget. I mentioned that the, the whole space business is changing and it's changing very rapidly. And, um, there are three things that are kind of happening all at the same time. 
Um, one is that, as I mentioned before, and I'll talk a little more about it in a couple of charts, the threat environment is evolving and escalating. There are more threats today than there ever were before. And that means that we need to somehow mitigate them. So threats are increasing. We also have, uh, particularly on the military side, but also on the commercial side as well, we have new missions. We have drones that didn't exist before. We have people that now want to communicate with satellites while they're driving a Humvee through the middle of the desert and they don't want to stop to set up an antenna. Um, we now want to put these terminals on smaller ships and maybe even the submarines that are unmanned. Um, there are all of these new, new things that people want to do with satellite communications and, and sensing um, that we also, now we have new requirements for performance and for functionality. But then on the third, third leg here is opportunities. And that is that we do have all this huge investment going on on the commercial side. The government is investing more. Um, people like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are creating much more affordable uh, access to space through cheaper rockets. Um, you know, rocket labs, uh, there are a whole, whole lot of people. That entire industry is being transformed. And there are whole new technologies coming on board, more uh, of everything, uh, more dense semiconductors, lower power, software defined, you know, whatever. Uh, all of this, this is the designer's toolbox here. And so that's how we're, we're trying to leverage all of this, this new opportunity in order to handle both the new threats and close these mission gaps. And it's a, it's a challenge. You know, there's a lot going on and it's a lot more complicated than it used to be. So when I talk about designing for resilience, you know, what do I mean by that? And normally, uh, like I said, we would have designed mainly for performance within our budget. For resilience, there, there are three things that we really have to keep in mind. One is the, the system and the mission requirements and the capability there. Uh, what are we trying to do? What is the product or the service we're delivering? Uh, what other limitations are there? The concept of operations, how do we use the system? How, how can it be configured? How can it operate? And then of course that threat description, which is essential. And that's really the, the wild card because it, it requires that you have information that you have to really go out and find. And, you know, if it's a, an adversary, you may not know it because they're, they're going to try and keep their capabilities hidden. If it's a natural phenomenon, you need to have as much data historically as possible. Um, but all three of these go together and that's what you use to create uh, a resilient system through design and analysis. And what that results in is some kind of a methodology and the methodology is, is just like we say for reliability or survivability, it is a known process that we go through in order to translate requirements into, uh, into performance and, and in this case into resilience. Um, so in, in the book that I wrote, I used a, a kind of a seminal publication by the Defense Department back in 2011, a fact sheet which had a very crisp and, and good definition of resilience. And uh, it, it forms a very good starting point for going down the, the path of getting a methodology in place. They identified four <clears throat> system attributes which provide resilience, uh, one of which is avoidance, robustness, recovery, and reconstitution. They define each of those. And then they have criteria for evaluating resilience because you have to, in some manner, value that quantitatively. And so this gives you some hints as to how you would go about doing that. Things like um, the severity of a shortfall or the risk that you're not going to meet your goal at some level of adversity. And in particular, things like the time over which you can tolerate an outage. These are things that could be measured. And eventually, if you take all of this together, uh, I eventually distilled that down into kind of a capstone equation here, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but it, it was the first opportunity 
to try to take these values and make them quantitative values in a way that we can start trying to calculate a value for resilience. Um, and that's important because as a designer, you need to be able to do something quantitatively. Qualitatively, you know, it's more flexible than this or it's more modular than that. It's very difficult to quant quantify, you know, flexibility. Here with resilience, at least we have a chance of, of doing that, even though we may not have all the information that we need or want. But um, that's kind of an occupational hazard. <laughs> Um, as I said, the threats, that, that's really where you're going to never have as much information as you want. Um, in that paper, they categorized two, two categories of threats. One is uh, adverse conditions. And adverse conditions are natural phenomena, things like solar flares, um, earthquakes on the ground, um, you know, lightning, weather. Um, meet micrometeoroids in, in orbit. Uh, hostile actions are actions that are directed by human intent. Um, adverse conditions could be the act of God category. Hostile actions, someone is deliberately trying to mess with you. So physical attack, uh, man-made radiation from a nuclear source in orbit, electronic jamming, th those are things people have to build systems in order to execute an attack against you. So the fact is that a lot of times when we talk about threats, people only think about hostile actions, but there are a tremendous number of what we would call adverse conditions that you also have to handle. And from the beginning, we did take some of those into account. We would certainly take into account solar, some solar radiation. We would take into account weather, um, but what, what's happened is that over the years, we just tended to identify these threats piecemeal, you know, one at a time here or there, and we would develop very specific uh, features in order to accommodate that. The whole idea of resilience is now you'd like to kind of have the grand unified theory of resilience at the top with a single ma mathematical model and methodology, and then all of these other threats and all are handled as special degenerative cases for each one. So you've got this umbrella, you know how to handle all of the threat portfolio, and you include only the threats that you really find credible. And that's an important point is because many of these threats that we're going to talk about were considered years ago, back in the 80s or earlier, but they weren't considered to be credible threats. So nobody did anything. You're not going to spend money if you don't think the threat is credible. But as time went on, what we found is that particularly with regard to hostile actions, um, more, more investment on the part of adversaries or competitors lead to a proliferation of these different kinds of threats. So back in the 1970s, we worried about the space environment. We worried about natural radiation, that kind of thing. We worried about weather, maybe earthquakes, um, things like that. As time went by, people noticed that we had interference, some of those sources were, they were all human generated, <laughs> but some of them were actual jammers that people were trying to jam uh, satellites. And so now you have to consider that. Um, at some point with the Cold War, there were potential nuclear threats where um, they're worried about people igniting a nuclear warhead in the atmosphere or above the atmosphere. So, you know, again, each one of these, as they emerged, there were techniques to handle them, particularly for the satellites. Um, as we go along, though, we start seeing even more of these threats pop up. Now you're talking about high power lasers that could uh, blind a, a satellite that's taking images. Kinetic weapons, uh, anti-satellite weapons from the ground, somebody firing a, a missile your way. Um, that was considered years ago, but it was never considered credible until 2007 when the Chinese uh, destroyed one of their own satellites to demonstrate they could do it. Um, all of a sudden, now you have to take it seriously. And of course, the big one here in the 2000s has been cyber. Uh, most satellite systems have a significant ground associated with them, as I said earlier, and they are just as vulnerable to cyber as other things, particularly if they're using things like leased lines. So the fact is that 
as we go, you know, forward in time, we just keep seeing more and more threats that, uh, that we have to deal with. And the fact is that all of those threats need to be considered when you're designing the system. And you have to understand, you know, what are, what are the targets? Where, where are you likely to have a threat uh, targeting you? Is it on the ground? Is it in space? Is it somewhere, um, you know, terrestrially? Um, we need to keep that in mind. We need to know how severe they are. So that's why I say it's, it's difficult sometimes to have as much information as you would like so that you can evaluate what your system behavior is going to look like when or if one of these threats is deployed against you. The part about designing is now we have to develop mitigations against these threats. And I mentioned before that they, uh, the DOD had identified four attributes. And it turns out that these um, attributes can be used in a particular sequence. Um, at the very beginning, if someone develops a threat, um, if you can see it coming and you have something you can do about it, you could potentially avoid it altogether. That means there was no impact to your system. Um, if you didn't avoid it, then it could impact your system. And at that point, it's a question of how robust you are, how much capability did you lose? Um, and then after that, if you did lose some, how much of the capability could be recovered? And then finally, reconstitution is kind of like recovering everything, uh, usually a very large part of the system, like an entire satellite. You know, I have these definitions here, but they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward um, in terms of interpreting them. Um, the only thing I, I noted was that uh, in the original white paper, they had reversed the definitions for reconstitution recovery. I use them in a reverse order because in the industry, recovery has had a long standing definition and recovery tends to be something that is uh, usually more localized and it's more quick. Whereas reconstitution, if you had to replace a satellite, it would take quite a while in order to get a satellite on the pad and get it up there, uh, even if you had one. If you look at each one of those uh, mitigation features, those attributes, you can start to make a list of a lot of the things that we can do or we, or we actually do uh, in order to create a higher value for one or more of these different uh, attributes. So if you have something that is moving around a lot or can move very quickly to get out of the way of something, that would be uh, improving the avoidance. Uh, if you have uh, you know, a satellite that has a lot of protection features, um, high damage thresholds, things like that, that would be robustness. So even if somebody sends a, a jammer your way, let's say, you, you can overcome it. That's, that's good. Um, active redundancy, if you lose something, you, you don't lose the service because you immediately switch over to a different, uh, a different uh, unit. Um, and you don't actually switch, it just comes online. Um, recovery, we do all kinds of things in, in recovery because satellites have to be autonomous to some level if they lose ground connection. Um, but you could also talk about on-orbit repair. That's something that's becoming a big deal, self-healing. And then reconstitution is really replacing or rebuilding a, a big chunk of the system. But all of those together are different ways that you can improve one or more of those four attributes. And as we saw before, they all kind of add up, sum up into a resilience number. The, uh, the other thing that's come up is that later um, in 2015, the Office of the Secretary of Defense published a white paper. Again, um, I said they are a little bit uh, obsessive about this. And what they did was they, um, they talked more about different types of mitigations, they, they broke it into what they call six sub-elements of resilience. And uh, they are these six that you see here, distribution, diversification, protection, disaggregation, proliferation, and deception. And um, it, it didn't neatly map into what they had done before. It provided um, different ways to, um, to provide threat mitigation, but 
not necessarily deliberately through those four attributes that I just talked about. Uh, four of them, uh, distribution, uh, diversification, disaggregation, and proliferation, specifically talk to the architecture, um, how you're segregating and allocating functionality. And the way you do that uh, can make a big difference on the resilience of a system. If you, uh, if you have something that's very concentrated, you have one giant satellite doing everything. If you lose that satellite, you could lose basically all your capability. If you can do the same, the same function, but you do it over four satellites and you lose one of those four, you only lost a quarter of your capability. So that's the idea between distribution and some of these others. But the fact is that if you think hard enough about it, you can actually take these six and you can kind of map them back into the resilience attributes. It's not like you're talking about two different things. It's kind of like you're talking about the same thing two different ways. And when you look at it from that point of view, you can look at different ways again of increasing your system resilience using uh, basically those six and, and I even included avoidance and recovery in here as well. But um, there are all kinds of different ways that you can do this. And that's what makes the problem so complicated is that probably 10 or 15, 20 years ago, uh, maybe half of these things either didn't exist or were prohibitively expensive. Uh, you really couldn't do it. But today, the fact that the cost curve is coming down, you have more capabilities in terms of new technologies. Um, now you've got this really kind of an M by N uh, matrix of, of complexity that you're needing to deal with. And it's probably more like three-dimensional. And here's a, a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, what, what you have is you have um, usually a system that has multiple satellites in it. So um, you'll have a system that might have six or eight satellites that are uh, covering the globe. And um, what you have is a basic trade in terms of if you're worried about some particular threat disabling a satellite or more than one satellite, um, you could do what I just said, which is you could take that capability and you could distribute it among a lot of satellites. And this is kind of the uh, OneWeb or Starlink model. I think Starlink's up to 4,000 satellites. They don't, haven't launched that many, but that's where they're going. Um, if you get to that point where you can afford to do that, and uh, they're, all, uh, they're all providing the capability through 4,000 different satellites, then where you are is that if you lose any particular satellite, it's, uh, first of all, it's a really cheap satellite relative to a really large satellite. And number two, you don't even notice it if you have 4,000 of them up there. So this is the extreme where you go to a highly proliferated or distributed system or architecture. And um, that's where you're, you're doing these things, distribution, proliferation, mission disaggregation. That's one way to get a very high, what I would call robustness through the architecture, which gives you a very high resilience to losing one or two satellites. The alternative here is where we've been for the last 40 years, which is we protect each individual satellite by putting protection features on there. And uh, you know some of these things we don't actually do yet, but people have talked about them. Things like maneuverability, it's kind of hard to do that with the bigger satellites. But certainly the idea of eventually having onboard uh, situational awareness, um, the idea of putting them in different orbits that might be more resilient, but basically protecting the satellite at the satellite level because if you get to a point where you've only got four satellites, but nobody can take one out because they're just so well protected, that's another way of getting higher resilience. So you could be on one end or the other, but you could also be anywhere in the middle because it's not an either or, it's, it's an and. So that's the, that's the key here. And um, when, I, when I put it in, uh, I'm a, one of only two graphs that I have here, um, being still being an engineer at heart, I had to have at least one graph. Um, what you see is that there are many ways to achieve resilience. And in this case, what I did was I took the prior example and for a system where you have, um, I think this one has eight, eight elements. Um, uh, but if you have a threat level of four, which means that people could be targeting up to four of your satellites, um, this is the protection. So this is elemental resilience over here. 
And this is the number of elements. So we're moving out in terms of distribution. So what it's showing is that each one of these lines is a line of constant resilience of value for the entire system. And it shows that if you started here where your satellite has a protection of, let's just say 40%, um, you could at six satellites have a system resilience of about 0.6. Well, 0.6 probably isn't really great. So you'd like to maybe move it up to 0.8. Well, you could either improve the, the protection on the satellite so that it goes from 0.4 to 0.7 and you'd still have six satellites. Or you could say, no, I'm not gonna do anything to the satellite, but I'm going to expand my, my constellation to 12. I'm gonna take the same amount of capability, but I'm gonna divide it among 12 satellites. And lo and behold, you're on the same curve. So either way, you got to the same level of system level resilience, either way, and you can move anywhere along that curve and you'll still get that same one. So you could have also made a satellite less protected and go to 14 elements and you still would have gotten 0.8. So this is just an illustration that there are so many different ways that you can combine these things in order to get what you need. And then this is the exact same curve, but what I've done is I've showed that the, the, the key trade parameter that isn't on the previous chart is cost. And the fact is that as you go from down here, which is uh, satellites that are cheaper because they don't have a lot of protection and fewer satellites, so the system is cheaper, as you go from the lower left to the upper right, the cost is going to continue to go up and it won't go up linearly. We found that out for sure. This is just notional, but you could see that there will be areas where you kind of have a lower cost in the blue where the resilience tax is maybe only 10%. You then would probably have another region where it's more like 10 to 25% and another region where it might be up to 50%. And then when you get way over here, it could be a lot more could be, you know, 100%. <laughs> You're doubling the cost of the satellite and, and the, uh, the satellite system. So the point is that now if you're running along one of these curves, what you'll find is that even though you're maintaining that system resilience across the entire curve, and you can do it with various numbers of elements and various protection values on the satellite, the, the cost isn't going to be necessarily the same. So that's the third element is now you're running along here and you're trying to find the lowest cost in order to meet what you need as a minimum value for system resilience. So again, this is just to illustrate how complicated it gets when you're looking at cost performance and, and resilience. And then kind of the last challenge that we have is that um, nothing is sitting still. Um, I, I keep saying that the threat environment is changing. Um, as you have a rising threat level, once you put a system in operation, particularly a space system where there is no Maytag repairman at 22,000 miles, once you launch that satellite, it pretty much is what it is. Um, if you're going to change things, you're probably gonna have to replace it. And so what that means is that at the beginning, you may have a threat level that's not that great, and as a result, you've calculated a certain resilience to that threat. But as time goes by, maybe there are more threats, the threat is getting more severe. If you don't do anything more, as, as that happens and you reassess the threat, the resilience of your system continues to decline. And at some point, it may get to a point where you're just no longer comfortable being confident that you're, you're going to maintain the service if that threat occurs. So, this is the challenge. The challenge is today, most of these large systems, particularly government systems, but also commercial, uh, they used to build big satellites and they would launch them and they should be in operation for 15 or more years. And 15 years is a lifetime now, it's like dog years. Um, after three to five years, things are gonna change. Well, how do you convince yourself that you've built a system that will still maintain its properties and that resilience level over a 15 year period. And that is the question that has yet to be answered because for most systems, you're, you're not gonna be able to convince yourself that that's the case. So what that means is that now a lot of uh, our customers are looking at 
can we build less complex satellites, more of them, do them on more of a production line, which is what people like OneWeb and Starlink are doing. And the satellites now only have to operate for three to five years, and then you replace them. And you replace them with a technology refresh, which means that you've already compensated for whatever has been happening out in the threat world. Um, you have new, new technology, you have new ways to deal with it. So um, you know, trying, trying to exercise that crystal ball uh, nobody, nobody has the crystal ball, but um, you're, as a designer, it's your job to try and look forward. And that's where things like flexibility start coming in is, are there ways you can reconfigure the system on orbit or use it in a different way that provides you a benefit against these threats rather than having to launch a whole new satellite, for example. You know, in summary, uh, this idea of, of resilience is not going away. I will tell you right now, when, um, when I first started, I, I actually was handed an assignment at work, uh, go out and figure out a way to calculate resilience back in 2012. I'll be honest with you, back then I thought it was the flavor of the month. I thought that I would uh, work on it for six months, I'd hand in a paper or something, and uh, it would disappear in a year or two. And that absolutely was not what happened. And they talk more about resilience now than they ever have before. Our commercial people talk about it. It's, it's everywhere. So um, it's going to be with us. We need to uh, continue to develop the methodologies, the, the language, um, make it a real discipline. At some point, we may even have resilience engineers like we have uh, reliability engineers. But we have to recognize that this is not a, a, free, a free feature. Um, there is going to be a cost. And we need to trade those mitigation approaches. And we have to understand what it could mean to performance. And we have to be clever. It's making us be clever again. It's not brute force anymore. Um, but the, the upside is all that investment that's going on, all these new products, all these new services that are out there, uh, it's mind boggling. If someone had told me what, what the world's going to be like in space in 2020, uh, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have believed them but that's where we are today. So this is gonna be a, an ongoing process that we need, to, uh, we need to live with, we need to embrace, <laughs> and uh, we need to educate people. And you know, one of the things that I think is going to happen is that this is going to start pushing down into our educational system. And you're going to start seeing more of this kind of, uh, this kind of mention uh, in a lot of areas, maybe not just even space. Um, with, with regard to uh, you know, universities and, and colleges, as well as companies starting to educate their, their workforce, um, system engineers and designers. So um, it's, it's really exciting though. It's a whole new field. Uh, there are no experts. And uh, you know, if, if you're interested in space, this is a, an aspect of space that gets you involved in the guts of the design in a whole new way. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Great, Mr. Birch, we have a few questions, um, several questions. We've got um, one from Carter Dana, and he says, I know Boeing had a lot of success in employing digital engineering into the T7A. Are you working the ideas and principles of digital engineering and model-based engineering into your programs? If so, how? Absolutely. Um, this is one that uh, I can honestly say Boeing is at the forefront in the aerospace industry. And it actually did start in our military aircraft area. Um, they were the first ones to really embrace it. We had been doing some, we've been nibbling around the edges in the space business. And um, what we have done is we have, uh, we, are, we are moving our entire system engineering process to um, model-based system engineering. And that includes using tools like Cameo. Um, <clears throat> we are using that to provide very high fidelity models for the entire system, not just the satellites. And we uh, use a lot of the tools that Boeing has developed internally, but they have now open sourced them. So you can find them on the web. Um, there's something called the, uh, the, the digital uh, diamond, which kind of shows the, the old style of what we used to do. We used to build a lot of stuff, test it in the lab, uh, 
Now what we're doing is we're building those models digitally in parallel, but slightly in advance of when we build hardware. So what we can do is we can exercise those models and we can really get a lot more data and information about the design than we ever could before. Um, it's kind of like uh, Mathematica or, or MATLAB on steroids is really the way I look at it. And so, um, you know, we, we totally understand that there is no replacement for high fidelity modeling and the people who know how to do it. And that is something else that I think that uh, universities, uh, if, if they can to start, uh, you know, using that as another platform because it's going to, all, all parts of aerospace are going to be taking this on and our uh, government customers are actually requesting and, and asking for us to do that uh, across the board. So yes, it's becoming, it's becoming a big deal and we're using it everywhere. We have another question. Are there resilient techniques that involve the entire communication topologies to work together and work dynamically, such as satellite being denied and the communication topology can be smart enough to reroute information to another satellite that isn't under attack? Absolutely. And um, these, these are great questions because they're teeing up a few things that I didn't say. One of the um, future mitigation technologies, if you want to call it that, that's going to be essential is the incorporation of uh, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, autonomy, and machine learning. As I said, we're really talking about communication systems here, information systems, networks. And previously, most satellite systems weren't really networked. Um, Boeing actually, we, we launched the first packet uh, switch processor back around 2000, but it didn't use any standard internet protocols. Now what we're seeing is these new, uh, the new, uh, new space systems that are coming out it's easier for them and cheaper for them to use those actual terrestrial inter interface uh, specifications and protocols. And so what that does is it extends the terrestrial network to space. But on the other hand, that also means that you could migrate any vulnerabilities or threats like cyber threats up into the satellites. So the fact though, that if you lose the satellite for whatever reason, but you can reroute around the satellite and you can do it autonomously is huge. And the fact that you're going to have more of these proliferated systems, so you have more paths, that, that path redundancy is, is going to be critical, but you don't want the operators on the ground to have to figure that out. It needs to be done machine to machine interface. So it is absolutely critical. We're at the forefront of that. One of the things that holds us back in the satellite business is that um, <clears throat> you'd like to have smaller satellites, but they need to have a certain amount of power. And unfortunately, digital processing consumes a lot of power. So there's a limit to how much we can put on board and networking generally takes a lot of power. But as that power requirement goes down because we have better chips and so forth, we're absolutely gonna be seeing more of this in the future. And at that point, you need to have cognitive systems that are embedded in the whole network, including satellites. And our next question, would you consider all those large amounts of threats because of COVID? You know, it's interesting because um, largely what I what we deal with when we look at threats tend to be um, threats that affect the system in a very physical way. Um, however, if you read some um, materials that are online, uh, there have been a couple of uh, white papers that the RAND Corporation has written. They have actually talked about uh, all kinds of other threats that are not technical, if you will, but could still have the impact of taking a system offline. It's harder to um, model those mathematically, although they are trying and they have some really serious math there that I'll admit I didn't quite get through. But um, for example, supply chain, we have to build satellites and ground stations and so forth from parts and components that we buy from a whole number of suppliers. There is obviously a concern that somebody could have a counterfeit or uh, some type of sabotage built into a chip um, that is an insider threat. You build it into your system, it gives them a backdoor into your system, that kind of thing. So having a, a robust supply chain that is quote unquote resilient, um, or if you had an offshore supply chain uh, supplier that you could lose if there are tensions between countries, 
um, and then you don't have that component available to you, you, you have a fragile supply chain, which means it's not resilient. COVID would be an example of that. If you have a pandemic to the extent that for whatever reason, you can't muster the resources to actually operate your system. You took out, you know, er everybody in a, in a particular ground site um, is in the infirmary. Um, that would be an example where, yeah, if you don't have some way of mitigating that, then it is another way to look at it is that that affects your resilience. So it, it could be a broader category than what I've shown here. It, there are all kinds of threats and it's a question of how you identify them, whether they're credible and if you have a way to, to deal with them. Thank you. And I have another question from Carter Dana. How do you design in resilience to a physical attack? I would guess that it would have to do with changing the orbit of the satellite to avoid the threat, but fuel on the satellite is finite, is a finite resource and having to move a satellite would displace it from the region it needs to serve. Right. And so this is where you, you get into some difficulties because there are um, a lot of proposed mitigation techniques is what I would call it, that haven't necessarily been demonstrated. And um, when you look at a satellite, a picture of a satellite or whatever, and it's this really big thing and it looks really you know, massive and, and strong. But if you actually see it in person and if you've ever had a chance to look at a satellite factory, what you find out is that it's actually somewhat fragile. And the reason is because we try to make things strong, but light. And so, you know, you, it's like you could probably with one hand, you could pick up a solar panel because it's all this composite and everything. Um, it turns out that on orbit, once these things are launched and the solar panels are deployed and radiators are deployed, um, that satellite isn't intended to move quickly. And even if it were to move quickly, it might damage itself in the process. So if you're going to design to get out of the way quickly, um, you probably need to design satellites differently than we're doing today. That's the first thing. The second thing that you brought up though is also important and that is the way that we define avoidance is the only, the only way you can say you totally avoided something is if there is no impact to the operation of your system. And so if you have a communication satellite, for example, and let's just say you could get out of the way of something that somebody is uh, sending your way, um, if you move like you're, you're talking about in the question, uh, but that basically takes your satellite offline for an hour uh, because you're no longer pointing in the right direction or whatever, then you didn't avoid it. You, you suffered a loss. You didn't suffer the loss of the satellite, but it did disrupt operations for an hour. And so that is a measure of robustness. And it turns out that you could argue that the threat was partially successful. So all of those kind of have to be handled in a, a somewhat subtle way, but they need to be accommodated when you're trying to you know, compare two different designs, for example, is this one really better than the other? Um, you need to take those things into account. Thank you. We have another question from Brandon Foreman. What are your thoughts on Starlink and OneWeb? Will the pro proliferation of numerous satellites in orbit do more harm than good? So first of all, I'm just gonna put a caveat up front and that is that right now at the moment, um, Boeing is not, uh, we, we have no proliferated satellite system. We don't have a dog in the fight. Uh, I think I can be pretty objective because we have monitored what's going on in the, in the market. Um, that being said, Starlink and OneWeb, um, there are, you have to differentiate, I think, between um, technical and business models. Um, from a technical point of view, it is probably undeniable that both of those systems will operate the way they've been designed to do. Um, what that ultimately means to users and like how much it's gonna cost for a terminal and what kind of actual service, quality of service you're gonna get, that's probably still up in the air a little bit. But um, technically, there's probably little doubt that they're going, to, they're going to do what they're supposed to do. From a business model point of view, that is a real question because in the late 90s, there were probably 10 different proposed systems very similar to these systems. There's Teledesic, Astrolink, Global Star, uh, Iridium. And uh, of those 10 or 12, only two of them ever actually got to orbit. And Iridium went bankrupt three times. So 
in, in their case, in 1995, um, the business model didn't hold. Global Star is the only one that's actually made any money at all that I'm aware of. These systems, you know, it's going to cost a lot to maintain them because you're going to have to continually uh, refresh the satellites. And if you've got 4,000 of them, that's a lot to refresh. So you have to get the cost down. You have to be able to charge enough to make the system profitable. That part, I don't know about. In terms of the third question, really, that's embedded in there, which is uh, pros versus cons. Uh, having that many satellites in LEO orbits is something we have never seen before in space. And um, space, as Jody Foster said in contact, is very big. But when you start loading up thousands of satellites in similar orbits, it's not quite as big as it used to be. So the idea that you, um, first of all, anybody that's going to put up 4,000 satellites, they need to have a strategy to deorbit them or put them in a safe mode. Um, at some point, you could have enough junk rolling around up there that uh, collisions become commonplace, and that's usually a really bad thing. Uh, you know, what, what we saw in the movie Gravity uh, with the Kessler syndrome is actually a real thing. Um, we haven't gotten to the point where that could probably happen yet, but, um, you know, there are things that could be very bad, and so the, U the U.S. government is trying desperately to migrate um, regulations from the Commerce Department to the FAA. They're trying to be more of a, uh, a policeman in space. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, it's a combination of all of those, and it's really uh, questionable, you know, the, the benefit to cost overall, um, but it, there's a lot happening right now. And that's assuming that um, that the space domain should be a controlled domain in your own opinion, is that correct? Right, I mean, there are, there are certain treaties and agreements that um, have been in place for a long time and are generally respected. But to keep in mind, up until maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, generally, there were very few spacefaring nations out there, maybe a handful. Um, you're talking about big countries like India, uh, Soviet Union, now Russia, China. Um, and what's happened is the barrier to entry has lowered so much, both from a, a, a rocket point of view as well as satellite point of view, that many more people are coming online. And that's one of the dangers is that you have people entering this market that don't have the history and the experience of having you know, understood what the, the genesis of all these regulations and agreements were. And it's kind of like, you know, if somebody just comes in out of the blue and says, oh, I'm going to just start launching hundreds of, of satellites. And what, what do you mean I have to have a way to re you know, re-enter them when they're dead? Um, that, that can also be a problem. And when you're talking about sovereign countries, and now you're talking about treaties and things like that. And so it's not as easy as a, a country where, I mean, a company where you might be able to actually have legal force on that. Um, so there, there's a lot of unknowns there. And it's, especially when it comes to orbital debris, um, th there is a whole whole you know, area of law that's being created. <laughs> Thank you. And one more question from Brandon Porman. What kind of advice do you have for undergraduate and or graduate level engineers that are entering and starting work in the space field? Well, the first thing I would reiterate is that it's, um, I won't say it's the Wild West, but there is a lot going on. And so uh, the first thing I would say is don't underestimate um, how many things are going on out there. There are a lot of jobs that are being created on a, from a wide range of companies. So it used to be if you'd come out of school, you would go work for maybe Hughes or TRW or Raytheon or, or whoever, and they're probably, you know, let's just say a dozen of the big companies and a couple dozen of the smaller companies, that is not the case today. And so you've got startups, you've got medium-sized companies that are like SpaceX now, you've got the large companies, you, you've got the entire range. And so if you're looking for something in particular, I would just encourage you to take some extra time to do the research to maybe find that niche that you're looking for. Uh, the second thing I will say though is that it is still true that there are differences in working at those different kinds of companies. I know people that have worked at SpaceX and other places. Um, the larger companies that are more of the dinosaurs like the Boeings and, and uh, Lockheeds, 
uh, we still do a tremendous amount of, of really interesting work. And, and we are looking for people all the time. And, uh, and we, but we have a lot of history. We have a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's more formalized, but we still do a lot of cool stuff. When you're talking about the new space, it really, there's a wide variation in the work uh, across company to company. And so once you do find that company or two that you are interested in, I would say do even more research to understand what it's like working there because the difference between working at SpaceX and working at Rocket Labs or working at Vox, they're all tremendously different, a lot more different than the difference between working at Raytheon and Boeing. Um, and, and some of the startups are literally startups. So you, you may be working for just a few bucks for a while and uh, hoping that those stock options come in, you know, just like uh, internet companies. But, but there's a tremendous amount and it's all over too. It's not just in LA or it's not just in, you know, in the Bay Area, it's Seattle, it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere, New Zealand. Um, so that's the other thing is if you're looking to work in a particular place, don't just say, well, there's nothing in St. Louis or there's nothing in, because you may be wrong. Um, these, these things are sprouting up everywhere. So good luck. Thank you. We have a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap this talk up today. Um, so we have another question from Francisco Lucia. Which main types, types of engineering professions work on the resilience section in your department? And what is, what is it about there that expertise gives them that authority? Well, so I would say that um, in our space division right now, we're still integrating this whole concept of resilient design um, into our systems engineering process. And that's really where it's located. So um, at the top level, it's being a system engineer and you know, having, having the experience and the education in systems engineering and integration. Um, however, it's going to flow down to pretty much the entire design process eventually. And so, you know, we already have, like I said, we have design engineers who work on nuclear survivability. We have people who work on communications payloads. Um, it's not going to be in one place. It's going to kind of invade all of the disciplines eventually. But I would say at the beginning, it's probably going to be more in a, in a systems engineering uh, organization. And they're going to own that, that whole uh, topic of resilience. And then they'll be in, in a, uh, it'll be up to them to ensure that it flows out to the rest of the organization appropriately. So it's, it's just the basics of understanding how to do design and um, the understanding of space systems and the understanding of, of how you do things like design trades. And, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to have some math under your belt um, because a lot of this, as uh, the previous question alluded to, is going to digital modeling and digital simulation and emulation. And this is going to fit right into that. Last question. Uh, is the resilience metric of a satellite something that's dynamic? Software defined systems allow for potentially pushing resilient software upgrades to your satellites and could potentially increase their resilience. But also the advent of new threats could make your previously high resilience metric for a particular satellite lower. So the, the, the short answer to that question is yes, it is dynamic. And I actually have a, <clears throat> a slide that I use occasionally that takes the resilience equation and everything becomes a function of time. <laughs> because over time, uh, new information comes to light. You have new knowledge and that knowledge can be positive or it could be negative. And as you point out, um, the, the point of it all is that uh, resilience is, is kind of a behavioral model of its own. What happens when a threat impacts your system? How is the system going to behave? And, and how is it going to operate after that? And so this idea of, of, yeah, you know, if you have software defined functions, that is kind of the holy grail. We're, we're putting more digital processing on board than we ever did before. And one of the reasons for that is exactly what you said. Um, if everything is, is reprogrammable and truly is operating software defined mode, you have a lot more flexibility because you can upload software, you can upload patches. It's like every month when Apple or Microsoft 
you know, sends you a new uh, OS patch because there's a security breach. Um, if you have a zero day exploit and there's nothing you can do about it, then yeah, your resilience may have gone to zero. Um, that is a problem. If you can reprogram the onboard cryptographic algorithm, that is a really good thing because if you can do it quickly enough, you can limit the, the window of vulnerability. So that is absolutely another key thing. And we are pursuing that probably more than anybody in the industry. We put more digital process payloads on board than anyone in, in, in the industry. And one of the reasons is exactly for that reason, because there are things that you could do from a, a digital or software point of view that will significantly increase your, your resilience against certain threats, and particularly an emerging threat that you, you may have just discovered, uh, maybe even a threat that the adversary doesn't know they have, <laughs> but you understand it because you know the ins and outs of your design, and you have the time to go in and, and mitigate that through these techniques you're talking about. So that's absolutely a big part of the future of these payloads for satellites, uh, but by the same token, there could be some threats that come up that you really can't do anything about, and that's the danger. I know we went a little bit over, but we really greatly appreciate all the wonderful information you were able to, to give our students, faculty, staff, the public. We just, it, very informational. Thank you. And um, we welcome everyone to join us uh, for our monthly tech talks. And you can find out more at fresnostate.edu forward slash tech talks. And again, thank you, Mr. Birch, for, for all your time today. And uh, we, we wish you a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to talk to everybody. I hope you, uh, you know, got a little bit of an appreciation for what, uh, what it's all about. And uh, good luck to, to all the, uh, the students out there. Um, and, and thanks again for inviting me. We hope to have you back next time in person. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you.